Welcome to Novel Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. Now, on with our program. This is Mike Consul. Thank you for joining the program. In the spotlight during this episode is Lisa Unger. Hi, I'm Lisa Unger, and I am the author of 20 novels of psychological suspense. I've been a writer all my life. I don't recall a time in my life before I define myself that way. But of course, I was a reader first, um, as are most or all writers. You know, that's where we fall in love with story in the pages of somebody else's book. Um, so I've been, you know, my mom was a librarian. And so I've been in love with story in all its different forms um, since I was a kid. So I'm very grateful to be able to um, spend my life writing novels. It's a dream come true. And she's a very modest woman because she has sold millions of copies worldwide in 32 languages. And she's regarded as a master of suspense writing. And one of her novels, Confessions on the 745, is now in development at Netflix and will star Jessica Elba. Lisa, you are in a position that novelists dream about are you are you cognizant of that do you realize that you're you're doing what there are millions and millions of people all over the world trying to achieve um you know i i am aware of that in that you know in that i feel incredibly grateful that i be able that i'm able to do it because i know um you know that so many people have this dream and that it's incredibly difficult to realize it and it's incredibly competitive to get published in the first place and it's even harder to succeed once you are published so i am aware of that um you know it's been um the writing life is uh not for the faint-hearted <laughs> no there's lots of dizzying highs and sort of crushing lows along the way um but I don't, you know, um, I, I never take it for granted is what I mean to say. It's always something that, you know, that fills me with gratitude that I've been able right. to come this far. Well, take us back in time. Let's go to when you, um, your career started. You're, you were writing, you were sending out, and I'm, I'm assuming that you, of course, did what we all do, sending manuscripts out to agents. Uh, you probably had many false starts with writing, you probably had many rejection letters from agents, unless you're one of the very few lucky ones. Talk <laughs> about, talk. I mean, clearly you're one of the few lucky ones, but talk about that first agent who said, hey, Lisa, I'm so-and-so, and I'd like to see the full manuscript, or I'd like to, I've read your full manuscript, and I want to represent you, or I think I want to represent you. How did that, that first break happen? Yeah. So, I mean, I have a little bit of a different trajectory than other, than other folks do. Um, you know, I actually started writing my first novel when I was 19 years old. I st started writing it when I was in, still, still in college. And, you know, I had been writing ever since I was a kid, like short stories, poetry, you know, my, most of my education was focused on writing and literature. So it was very much a, a passion and, you know, I knew that it was what I wanted to do with my life. Um, but my dad, you know, was, is, was an engineer. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when I brought it up to him that I thought I would like to write, he basically just said, yeah, no, that's, that's a terrible idea. Um, you should be worried about getting a real job. And this is not a real job and people don't do this for a living. Is your and dad so, alive and well now? He is. <laughs> does, what does he say to you now? Does, has he ever made a statement to you that Lisa, you, yeah, I was no. wrong. You did it. Any, anything like that? No, I mean, in fact, you know, I feel like I'm still like the equation that, you know, he just can't solve, like it never should have worked, <laughs> but it did. So, yeah, I mean, my dad is, you know, my parents are both big supporters and fans and, you know, and all that stuff. But, you know, I think he still doesn't quite believe that I made it happen. And maybe he's just happy that he like doesn't have to support me. <laughs> Well, you know, you uh, uh, not only are you commercially successful, but you received two Edgar Award nominations. And it says here that was an honor held by only a few authors, including Agatha Christie. Now, yeah. simply nominations? Uh, yes. No, did I, I didn't win either one of them. <laughs> but did I, Agri was nom I was nominated for my, a short story that year and for um, my novel that year. And um, I know I, I didn't win either of them. <laughs> 
So, uh, you know, we just have to go with the nomination is a win in and of itself and be happy with that. Absolutely. Just, and it's, just it's to have an two things nominated in a single year is, is kind of a big deal. Like that was very shocking and exciting. So, yes. Yeah. Well, and it's indicative of the fact that your novels are, I, I guess we can say literary. Uh, in fact, you you have said that you walk a fine line between literary novels and commercial thrillers, you know, and all writers want to earn both commercial acclaim and have a large commercial following. But describe that dividing line you're talking about or dividing lines between what you see as a literary suspense novel versus a commercial suspense novel. Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't define myself as either. I don't define myself as a literary writer or necessarily as a writer, just as a writer of psychological suspense. And I don't think most writers, when they sit down to write, especially when they, they start writing as young as I did at 19, I didn't have any idea of myself as being a literary writer. And I didn't necessarily choose to write thrillers. It was just sort of the natural evolution of my taste as a reader and the things that I was curious about and interested in. So I feel like, you know, I I feel like when I sit down to write, I have a character in my head. I have a character voice in my head. And it's that character that I follow through my narrative. And it just so happens that it's always suspense. And it also just so happens that I care very deeply about my writing. You know, that that's something that's really important to me. It's not just about telling a story or constructing a plot. You know, it's just something that, you know, I've always cared about as a reader and as a writer. So I'm not sure, like, I think these different, um, you know, labels that they put on you, like your, your publisher will want to label you, your, you know, the booksellers want to label you. And this is, you know, primarily because they want to know how to market and sell your book, which is a very good thing. But as a writer, I think most of us, when we sit down, especially when we start as young as I did, we're just sort of following that passion and those voices in their head. And I think as long as you're doing that and continue to do that, then you're probably, you know, writing in a way that's true to who you are, regardless of your labels. Well, then critics also are discriminating about whether it's literary or or not. Sure. And, and readers, I mean, I, I like literary style novels. I mean, you are said to emphasize character driven novels. And I think one of the things that happens in all forms of genre writing is that you do have a lot of authors who are very plot heavy. This is what mm -hmm. you were alluding to. They're very heavy on plot. And they just zoom that story along, but the characters are almost like folding chairs. I mean, you right. you and and they're cast aside very easily. You really uh, are are more focused on character driven novels, but at the same time, you know, you've you've got a well plotted novel. Talk a little bit about um, about that uh, the, kind of that balance between you want a plot that drives the reader forward, but at the same time you want to take time to develop your characters. Yeah, and that is always a balancing act. You know, for me, it's all about character, and that's you know where every novel starts, um, and that's true for me as a reader too. You know, like if I'm not involved, deeply involved with character then, you know, the plot matters to me, not at all, right? Like you could just sort of, you know, if you're, if you're like very into something, into a book for its writing and for the way that you're feeling about the characters and how you're watching their lives unfold, like as a reader that, you know, that sustains me more than, than any kind of plot concerns. Um, as a, as a writer, you know, all plot flows from character for me. It develops on the page for me much in the way it will develop for my reader. Um, but, you know, in commercial fiction and popular fiction, thriller, crime writing, mystery, you know, obviously pacing is also a concern. But um, I am, you know, very much so um, involved in the lives of my characters and watching them unfold. And it's much more important to me to develop them so that when the the heat and the action does come to play in uh in the plot then my readers are going to be as involved with my characters as I am because you know you can't it doesn't matter what happens in a book if they if they're not there for the character for their love of character right right if you don't care about the character it's kind yeah. of a, it's kind of incidental if they get their head chopped off or something exactly like that. i mean it's like a lot of times you see book you know books that start with a propulsive beginning or even you know even film television it starts with a very action oriented scene and for me as a viewer or a reader like that just leaves me cold like i'm not interested in that like you know that 
exciting or propulsive beginning unless I'm, you know, deeply involved with that character. And how can you be if you've only seen them or been reading about them for, a, you know, a page or whatever? Mm -hmm. Now, you have said that you don't plot your novels. I mean, you start the writing. And I don't know how much is in your head in terms of just generally, this is what I'm writing about. Um, but you don't actually, and I think this is kind of unusual for, particularly for a, a genre writer, to not plot the novel. How does it work for you? How do you actually, because uh, because I tried writing novels without a plot and I wrote myself into a corner. <laughs> now, so how do you kind of approach that? Well, so for me, there's usually a germ or a seed or, you know, something that I'm obsessed about um, that I sp spend a lot of time researching. Like, so for in the, you know, in the, you know, for example, with Secluded Cabin Sleep Six, which is my 20th novel, you know, I had some things that were, you know, very much on my mind, like DNA testing was something I was really interested in. I'd been researching, you know, the industry and the technology for a while and then, um, you know, my um, my family and I took some, uh, during the pandemic, we took some vacations to secluded cabins in the woods, right? And so like, you know, my thriller's mind kind of got twisted around some of those places that we stayed and like, what could go wrong here? And so it was like those two things were what were interesting me or obsessing me at that time. And then I started to hear, for me, the first voice that, you know, brought me into the book was a character by the name of Hannah you know, she was a young mom and, you know, she was uh, gathered with her family at dinner when everybody suddenly is, is given as a gift, a DNA test. And so that's all I really knew about the book. When I first started, I had Hannah's voice. I, I had a sense of her as a person, you know, she's like, you know, struggling in her role as a new mom, you know, about to like leave her daughter for the first time to go away with her husband. And, you know, just has this kind of script that's been written for her. Like she's the good girl in the family, the, the moder the mediator, the one who like cleans up everybody's messes. Right. So I had this idea of her and who she was. And so the way it works for me is I just, you know, start writing that scene or following that voice that I hear in my head and the story just starts to build and develop from there. Um, and it does unfold for me on the page much in the way that it would for the reader like they're really I have maybe an essence an idea of sort of what the book is probably gonna be about in terms of you know some big themes or big pieces that I'm interested in but there's certainly no like for me there's no uh, outline um, I'm not sure who's going to show up day to day I don't know what they're going to do I have a vague sense of what the book is about but I definitely don't know how it's going to end it's almost as if I write because you know I write for the same reasons that I read because I want to know what's going to happen to the people living in my head and so I mean but you I want it to reveal itself I do I want it to reveal itself and the best way I can explain it is that you know I've been reading since I was a kid I've been writing since I was a kid and I find that a lot of people who do write the way I write have have that they have been writing since they were children you know um, and it's almost like somebody like didn't tell your your brain that it had to stop telling stories, right? Like nobody ever, your brain never got the memo. And then spending all my years as a reader and then studying craft and studying the novel and studying, you know, screenplays, it's almost as if like the, the form of the story, the story form is like in, is something internal to me. And so it's just the way my imagination unfolds. Right. Um, of course, this is all first draft stuff, you know, there's second and a third and a fourth and a fifth draft, you know, where, you know, less, there's less magic and more craft that, that comes into play. But truthfully, at the end of that first draft, structurally, I'm pretty close to where, to where the novel is going to be. There's going to be editorial work, of course, but it's not going to be like a restructuring or like this didn't work or, oh, what, you know, because it's just not the way the story unfolds for me. Right, you know, like right. I'm going to be writing click, click, click. And then, you know, I'll run into some kind of a, you know, like a speed bump or whatever. I'll get up and walk the dog or go to the gym or do whatever. And then I'm going to feel or hear, or see the next thing. And then I'm going to go back to the manuscript. And that's kind of how it unfolds for me. There's not a ton of intellectual decision-making 
Um, it's not like I'm th sitting around thinking, what's going to happen next? What is this character going to do? What do I want that character to do? I don't have any of those thoughts. I don't make right. any. Right. Right. Well, you have a solid sense of structure because you've read so much and, and now yeah. you've written so much as well. Exactly. So Lisa r referred to Secluded Cabin Sleep Six. That's her latest novel. It sounds, you know, on the surface, like it might be an Airbnb advertisement, but <laughs> because it says a novel under there and because it's it, it's in the suspense section of a bookstore and Lisa Unger's name is on it, uh, just that title alone, Secluded Cabin Sleep Six, you can imagine that oh, the sorts of things that are going to happen. And the readout on this is three couples rent a luxury cabin in the woods for a weekend getaway, uh, a weekend getaway to die for in this chilling locker room thriller, a locked room thriller uh, by New York Times bestseller, bestselling author Lisa Unger. So when you were staying in cabins, uh, did you have some sleepless nights because you're imagine you allow your imagination to I mean, this was kind of a research project in addition to being a, a vacation. So did you have some sleepless nights at all? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always have sleepless nights. Yeah, <laughs> that's like sort of the natural <laughs> condition of the writer, right? I um, yeah. I mean, I I feel like the problem with going on vacation, especially for me, is that like I have to take myself with me, you know, because like any kind of downtime that I that I give myself, you know, my imagination just kind of you know takes flight. It's almost as if I can't see any type of beautiful or idyllic, you know, setting without going. I wonder what could go wrong here, you know? So mm -hmm. yeah, I did. There was all kinds of things that, you know, were curious to me. I mean, the whole Airbnb thing in general, not that this was an Airbnb, an Airbnb rental, but we did rent some cabins at, um, in like the Blue Ridge area and the Asheville area. And, um, you know, we just sort of, you know, really it's something that we just do and that we have done. And I thought, you know, I started to think like how, you know, how much we take for granted when you, you know, when you just get online and rent someplace and then you just go there and you, you know, you move your stuff in and you live in this house. And, and it's just such an odd thing that we all, that, that, you know, 10 years ago, 20, you know, 15 years ago, it wasn't even an option, right? Like it wasn't like, it's like this internet dating for your house now. And uh, you, and so that was one of the things. And then, you know, I started thinking about the lock codes on the door, you know, um, does everybody get that same code or <laughs> is it different for everybody? Yes. You yes. know, and it's all those kinds of things that you start thinking about, like, wow, it's really isolated. You know, there really isn't anybody else around, you know, what does that mean if something goes wrong? You know, how would we get help? Like all this different kind of stuff. Cell phone service was spotty. You know, we did have a couple of nights of, you know, very bad weather. And so it's mainly just, but, you know, this is, it's not like, you know, this isn't the way my brain works because I'm a thriller writer. It's more like I'm a thriller writer because this is the way my brain works. So yeah. I've always but it is, you know, thing. you mentioned the code. I mean, I, I, I get it because I, I just spent about a week in New Orleans in my, with a, my wife and a couple of friends. And we go up to the door and my wife was the one who made the reservation. She had the code and she says right out loud. So the code is this and that. And it's like <laughs> neighbors are right there. Like, and it's yeah. like, don't don't say this out loud. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. and, you know, people people listen sometimes. I mean, you certainly your imagination can certainly um, yeah, run amok. Uh, sure. Now, you're also said to um, it said that your writing is often experimental. In what ways does it does it veer into the experimental? What what would you consider to be experimental about your writing? That's so strange. I have heard this a couple of times. I've gotten this question a couple of times about my writing being experimental, and I really have no idea what that means. <laughs> well, I pilfered that right <laughs> off your website. You know, I, I pilfered it right off I, your website. I don't know. I, I know that somebody, somebody must said have wrote it. that for you. <laughs> I know that somebody said it about me, but I don't know who I don't know who it was. I think that there might be. Um, on the website, there must be like something that is, I don't, I don't, that I'm not aware, <laughs> that I'm not aware of. I just don't, um, I don't know that you could consider my writing to be experimental in any other way than, you know, I follow my care, my character voice and, you know, I go where the story um, demands to go and I follow it to its conclusion. And, you know, I have all kinds of questions about, um, you know, the human psyche and the mind, the brain and how, you know, things work. And so there are in some cases in some of my novels, they do 
sort of, um, you know, kind of dip their toe into the supernatural, but only in the most Jungian sense, you know, mm-hmm. only in the sense that, you know, the brain, there's, there's nothing but questions about the human brain. You know, we know more about space than we do about our own inner galaxy, right? And so like the, I think that that, when people say that, I think that that's what they mean. That like, I'm just willing to go wherever the story takes me. Mm. I'm not, I'm not confined by formula or, you know, what people think a thriller should be or any of that stuff. I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna, gonna honor the story that, that wants to be told. So a lot of, I think writers out there think in terms of getting famous, being successful and having people handling things for them. But I see a lot of infrastructure in your, uh, yeah, on your website. And by infrastructure, I mean, you've, you've created a platform. You've got the homepage, of course, and the books, and then you've got the about page, but you also have news and events and you have a blog and you have a newsletter and then there's contact information. Uh, there's there's a, a listing of uh, places that that your bookstores you're visiting to do readings and meet readers. How big a deal is? I guess I want to ask this on a couple of different levels. Levels. Yeah. How how big a deal is it to have this platform in place? And how big a deal is it for you to have to maintain it to whatever degree that you do? Uh, to keep it and, and I guess thirdly whether this is something that you really enjoy or is it just hey I have to do this be- because this is what keeps things you know the momentum high yeah it's such a layered question and a layered answer you know how important is it um I think that in this modern age to have a place where you can interact with your readers, booksellers, other authors, all that, like to have that, you know, between your website, your newsletter, social media, I think that, you know, it, it can be a very powerful tool um, of discovery and also, you know, sort of interacting in real time with people that want to be connected to you. So I think it can be a powerful tool. Um, I, I, most of the work this of social media and you know the newsletter and all of that stuff is done by me and my husband like mm-hmm. all the content that you see out there is me i provide it and all the dissemination is done by my husband jeff who's been you know sort of my partner in crime you know for uh, almost 20 years now in terms of you know he's always been like the IT guy the tech guy uh like the guy in the chair we like to call him <laughs> <laughs> does he, he know like, does he know when you have had i mean can he tell the difference when you've had a good or bad writing day uh, yeah i would say so yeah <laughs> what are the, what t- talk about what what kind of mood or personality do you bring uh to him uh, uh, on a good versus a bad day how how was he able to discern between the two what what's the difference I mean, I think that everybody knows when I've not had a not had a particularly good writing day. I feel like a little bit unmoored, you know, when it's not when I'm not like, you know, solid in what I'm working on or if there's been days where there's been like, you know, too much promotion and not enough creative time, then, you know, then I'm 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 not my I'm not my happiest self. I can get a little maybe just a little bit cranky. <laughs> Yeah, not yeah. terribly, not terribly so. But like we have this funny thing that we talk about that like, you know, you have like when you write the way I do, it's a very organic process, right? So like with all organic process, there's an ebb and a flow, and you have to be as comfortable in the ebb days as you are in the flow days because those ebb days are like where everything is kind of gestating, you know, and you're gonna, you know, it's when you're waiting for the next moment or feeling or vibe or whatever. And I always have this feeling that like my manuscript you know, kicked me out. Right. Like, it's like, you know, I just was like, okay, that's it. I'm done with you. Get out. And so then I'll go down to Jeff, like my office is on the top and, you know, his office is down a a flight and I'm like, it's not working. I, you know, I can't do this. I don't even remember how to write a novel. Right. He's like, yeah, I know it's okay. Why don't you just go back up there and go back to work? (laughs) I'm like, okay. And then it lets me back in and it's all, you know, it's all good again. And it's just kind of like, that's just like the normal, the normal process, especially when you like work together, you know, and you work in the same house. It's like, 
you know, you're going to have those kinds of interactions for sure. So talk about the writing process. You have, like any writer, you, you must have a routine. Mm -hmm. What is your routine for getting a novel written? Well, I mean, my golden creative hours are from 5 a.m. to noon. Those are those are my best hours always. Um, it's the closest as I can be to my dream brain. The earlier I can get up and get working before everybody is awake, before the world starts to wake up, the better it is. Um, you know, of course, I'm a, I'm also a mom, so I don't always get those hours. I am a, and I'm a professional writer, so I write whenever. Um, you know, I write every day. I have you know, if I don't work in the morning, I work in the afternoon. So it's not like anything precious. Like oh, if I can't work in the morning, I can't work at all. There's no preciousness to my routine. But if I um, if you know, if left to my own devices and all is well you know, I'm at my computer by five or in my notebook or whatever and writing until my daughter goes off to school. And then I have another really, you know, another really big chunk from like seven to noon. And those are really important hours. Um, and I feel like over the years, you know, it's like the idea of inspiration and, you know, when it comes and is it elusive and all that, it's like, you know, yes, inspiration comes and part of the process is magic, but a lot of it is just discipline. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of it is just being there for the magic to happen. And after so many years of, of writing in this way, like for me, that's the time where, you know, it feels like a magical time where flow is most available to me. So five to noon is a lot of hours. And, and, it is. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're definitely putting in the time. Is caffeine yeah. involved? Of course. <laughs> okay, so there's caffeine. What about food? And if there is food, I suspect maybe you would never eat a, a large meal because it would just That's deplete true. your no, energy. There's very very little food early in the day. Yeah, like just maybe a like toast or something like that, just to get you know, just to get some energy, like toast and peanut butter or something like that, and just get the energy going. And then, yeah, not not very much. No, you're right about that. So the, um, is there anything else about the, those hours? Do you do anything, uh, do you have a ritual? Do anything ritualistic, anything you do, any incantation, any way you start the process or you anything you do along the way or even a little um, a talisman somewhere? Is there anything that you would point to that is kind of like, uh, this is makes me idiosyncratic or ritualistic? You know, I mean, I would say quite the opposite. Yeah, I don't believe in rituals or props or any kind of tool or talisman or anything like much in the way that, you know, I try not to rely on those things when I was like, you know, putting my daughter to bed at night, because when you lose those props, if there's some, if there's something that gets taken away or you don't have your ritual or you can't do your ritual, then does that mean you can't write? You know, like I can't have, I can't have that kind of preciousness in my process. You know, mm -hmm. the most important thing is that, yeah, I've set my intention um, to be, to be solidly creative and not to be distracted by the more shallow work of mar marketing and social media and stuff like that. I don't toggle between the creative work and the, um, the other work of, of marketing, um, so that's the most important thing for me is that I've set my intention and that, you know, I have a, my, my desktop doesn't have access to any, um, doesn't have access to the internet. So I work there on, on my fiction and then my laptop where I'm, you know, talking to you through that right now, that's on a standing desk in another part of my office. And that's where I do the other work that I do. So do you do some of your writing standing? Oh yeah, sometimes I do. Mm -hmm. So your desk is adjustable so that you don't have to be sit sitting in a chair the whole time. That's you right. can okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, so where did you grow up, Lisa? Um, I was born in Connecticut, and um, then my family traveled. We lived in the UK and the Netherlands. Mm. Then came back to New Jersey, where I went to uh, middle school and high school. And then um, I went to college in New York City. I started at the at NYU mm -hmm. and graduated from the new school. Um, and now I live in Florida. What did you study in college? Writing and literature. 
Okay. So you knew, I mean, you said you started at 19, you knew uh, yes. your direction in life, what you wanted to do. Yes. And you live in Florida now. Yes. Um, unaffected by the hurricanes recently, I hope. Uh, luckily, yes, we, we were, we were um, spared the worst of that. Now, Florida, does Florida give you any, um, your your novels are not particularly set. You're not like Carl Hyacinth. Carl Hyacinth sets all his novels in Florida about, <laughs> you know, reprobate developers and politicians <laughs> and that sort of thing. You move around uh, in terms of your um, uh, your venues. I right? do. I tend to, oh, my books tend to mainly be set in the Northeast. I have a fictional town called The Hollows. I, you know, go back to New York City quite a bit in my fiction. I still spend a lot of time there. I still consider it my second home um but recently you know just for some florida settings have started to find their way into um into the into the novels but again you know that's another organic thing you know like i couldn't choose to write about florida it has to like find its way into um into the work and it it, it definitely did so in secluded cabin right now what about understanding the human psyche obviously that's a big part of what you do is you're playing on that psyche understanding the human psyche in terms of your characters maybe thinking about the readers to some degree have you done any any formal study on that or to some degree we all understand the human psyche because we've got one although a lot of times we don't understand ourselves that well but right. then we know a lot of other people who's in kind of their phobias and and such is, have you done, I guess what I'm getting at, it has to do with uh, research or any ancillary education that you may have um, um, uh, brought brought into your life? Yeah, I mean, I took quite a few psychology courses in college. And then, you know, I always, you know, say about my life that it's kind of like a continuum, right, of research, reading experience and writing you know like i i it is one of my deepest curiosities is you know what makes us who we are you know what you know what make what turns one person into a hero and another person into a murderer or you know is it nature is it nurture is it some impossibly complicated helix of both of those things and so I spent a lot of time just research, you know, researching and talking to people and paying attention to people when they talk to me and observing. I mean, I think, you know, the natural condition of the writer is to observe. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time looking and thinking and 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 researching just in our presence, in our lives and in the world. And then, of course, there's just, you know, nonstop reading. I'm also a news junkie, you know, I'm constantly sort of, you know, taking in news um, from all different sources. So it really is kind of a continuum. Like if I had something, you know, really important that I wanted to explore, I'd start as we all do on the internet. Um, I, if I need more, I'm going to find a book that I need, a book or books that I need to read and kind of dive into. And if I need even more than that, then I'm going to find somebody who's willing to hang out with me and to talk to me. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of an ongoing research is a big part of my process and it's an ongoing part of my life. So in addition to the 20 novels you've written, you've also written a novella and mm -hmm. in 10 short stories. Is, is that still accurate? 10 short stories you've written? I was just trying, I was just thinking about that. Yeah, I, I think that's right. <laughs> I've just written another one. So maybe 11 is accurate. <laughs> so that's what? Yeah, I mean, what what about the um, obviously you prefer the novel format. I mean, that's that and also it's what's worked for you. Your readers expect to get a full full length novel. But what about short stories? Are, do, do they actually give you the space you need to deliver in a condensed form something that might have been a novel? I mean, is it, are they are they kind of like a Twilight Zone episode? <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. I very recently fell in love with the form of short story writing. And I, um, I, I love writing short fiction. It's not an, they're not abbreviated novels. They're their own thing. You know, they're their own 
little vignettes or stories that exist exactly as they are you know they're like these perfect little spheres of story and I can do that I can write a short story while I'm writing a novel like I couldn't write two novels at one time but I can I find that I can compartmentalize enough to have like a short story going while I'm writing a novel and it provides like a little, um, you know, it, uh, like a, it's like a mental break that nourishes. Um, and, and when I go back to the novel, I often feel pressure for having written a short story. There, you know, a novel is like a long relationship. It's a relationship that takes place over a year, sometimes more. Um, a short story, it, I'm not sure, you know, like I've, it, it could be any amount of time from two weeks to three months or whatever, but it depends. Um, but it's about, you know, it's like this big, it's like this burst of energy and creativity. It like, you know, it's, it's often very intense. Um, so it's just completely different. There are completely different, um, places for me to create. And I enjoy, I enjoy both. I enjoy both for, for different reasons. What do you try to accomplish with a short story? I mean, are, is it kind of a beginning? Do you think in terms of a beginning, middle, and end, would a short story end like one of your novels ends? Or are you trying to do something aside from your novel writing? I mean, again, it's it's really just, again, it's really about character and about character voice. You know, it's like who shows up? What, what do they have to say? What do they want to do? Where are we going to go with this? Um, you know, and... Um, it's not, again, it's not the same. It's not this totally the same process as writing a novel. Um, but it's not dissimilar in that, like, you know, I'm not going to outline my short story. I don't have a, the sense of the beginning and the middle of the end until I'm in it. Um, so in that way, it's, it's kind of the same process. Gotcha. So yeah. how much public speaking do you do? Uh, a lot. <laughs> What is generally your content? So you're in front of an audience and you're going to, I mean, aside from reading, for instance, you go to a bookstore, let's say, uh, for, uh, you know, here's an author appearance and you're going to probably read excerpts from your latest novel. But if you're other than that, what kind of content do you try to deliver to the to, to your um, to your fans or the the people that you're hired to speak to? Well, I find that most people really want to just hear about the trajectory of your life and your career. Most people, readers, you know, um, who come out to these events are very interested in how you got from aspiring to published. Um, they, you know, they love to hear that the, the story about, you know, me being, you know, a young writer um, and like asking my dad if he thought I could write and him saying no, <laughs> You know, like just the details of your life I have found are more interesting to your audience than kind of anything else. And then I, you know, I talk about the book, the most recent book that I'm, what inspired it usually. I don't dive really deep into what it's about. I'll give them a, a teaser of what it's about. Most people don't come to hear you talk exhaustively about your novel, um, but you know, talk a little bit about that. And then Usually when I open it up to questions, you know, we talk about things like similar to this conversation, you know, what is your routine like? What inspires you? Where do you get your ideas? You know, um, what, you know, when do you write? Why do you write? You know, how do you deal with the business of publishing? That's Those are a lot of the questions that come up, like titles and things like that. And um, yeah, and so it's it's pretty much that it's it's pretty much that type of talk, and it's always like a little bit different, you know. It's always a little bit different depending on the audience and who you know who who's present and what they want to know. But I try to you know be really there for my audience because usually if they've come to see me, they're already fans, um, they're already readers, so they want it. They want to connect. So I try to be really present for the group and just say, Hey, I'm just going to start talking. And then hopefully we can just, it just turns into a chat. And that's generally what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, have you ever lived uh, something approximating one of your novels? I mean, in terms of something death defying or just plain frightening? Well, I mean, I guess the, the thing that I point to most often is that, you know, when I was 15, 
um, a girl in my school, a friend of mine was abducted and murdered. Mm. And wow. um, it was this very, you know, obviously horrific episode in our um, in our town, which was like this very sleepy kind of semi-rural New Jersey town. Um, it's like the kind of place where you move your family to be safe, you know, and everybody felt safe. Um, and, you know, she wasn't, you know, like my close friend or my best friend, but she was somebody who, you know, we played violin together on the school orchestra and uh, she missed her bus and she walked home, which should have been completely fine because a lot of people walked home and, um, she never made it home. And it was this terrible tragedy and something that, you know, sort of um, changed the way I saw the world. Like the world was one thing before that happened and another thing afterwards. And so I had a lot of questions. I already had a lot of questions, um, but I had a lot more questions after that, you know, like why her and how could this happen? And, you know, who was this person and, and why, why would he ever, you know, hurt a young girl in that way and so I feel like in some ways that I was already a writer and I already had a lot of dark sort of curiosities and this event you know really um broadened my uh my my need to understand why people are the way they are now did they catch the guy oh yeah mm -hmm. so they got the you know you ended up finding out what happened just in terms of what uh, yeah. his motivation was i mean obviously he had something wrong with him to well, do something like that yeah. um wow i'm sorry to hear that that must have been tra uh, traumatic um yes and it did eventually wind up um it was uh, it wound up not the not the full retelling i never wanted to do that like i never wanted to tell the story of that you know, that time and, you know, um, my friend, because I never wanted to cause anybody any more pain than they'd already endured. Um, but there was a piece of that story that um, I brought forward with me and that was mine to tell. And that piece sort of found its way into a novel uh, entitled Fragile. Mm. And I was about 25% into the book when I realized, oh, okay, you know, here it is. You know, it's finally found its way into the work. And it was almost like I had this story, I had this piece that I brought forward, but I needed to be better. I needed to be a better writer. I needed to have written eight novels. I needed to have become a mother and a wife and to understand layers of what happened when I was a kid that I could never have understood then at 15. Um, and so it's like, a, in some ways, it, it's kind of, you know, kind of illuminates my process and how it works. You know, it took, you know, many years for that piece to metabolize itself into the work. So you, your mother, you mentioned that a couple of times. How many children do you have? Um, uh, just one. And a, and a labradoodle. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you have a, a daughter or son? I do, a daughter. Okay. So um, have you ever met one of your characters outside your book? I mean, met somebody who's like, and uh, let me tell you why I'm asking this question. Stephen King walking down the side of the road. Yeah. And a van comes along and hits him, nearly yeah. kills him. He's unconscious. He 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 comes to... And he told the story that there's a guy sitting on a rock um, saying, well, there's something to the effect of, well, look at the kind of day I'm having. I go and hit Stephen King. He knew who he was. And um, he said, basically said, you know, well, help is on the way. But there was a, the things this guy said and who he was. He said he, the guy was a character right out of one of my novels. <laughs> and um, now that that's an extreme case because it's. Stephen King was, you know, badly, badly injured, almost killed, um, yeah. and fortunately recovered. But um, have you ever met people out just in your everyday life where it's like, wow, that person just feels suspiciously like this or that character? Yeah, I, I have had a couple of them. Certainly nothing like that. Certainly yeah. nothing to that extreme. But, you know, there are a lot of times where I see somebody 
And there's just like some kind of energetic output from that person that makes me incredibly curious about them. And, you know, like I might watch somebody, I'm not going to say that I will like follow that person, but like, you know, if I was in the grocery store, maybe I would <laughs> make myself, you know, there's a couple of circumstances like that, where you just see somebody and you like, you know, that they're going to do something bad or they're, they're thinking about doing something bad or, you know, they're creating chaos, you know, for some reason or another. So yeah, I've had plenty of experiences like that. I I've had, you know, um, uh, a, a, a guy who like wa walked into a gym where I was working out and I swear to God, he was like a character that was in one of my, my earlier books, like exactly the way I would have envisioned him. And, um, yeah, there's a, you know, some, some weird stuff like that, but mostly they just kind of, you know, they just kind of exist in my head and <laughs> yes, luckily yeah. for everybody, that's, yeah, yeah you wouldn't want him. <laughs> you wouldn't want them showing up too often. <laughs> Not too often. We don't want them creepy. showing up too often because then we're starting to get worried about things. <laughs> um, you, um, I lost my train of thought here. Let me see here. I wanted to ask you about, you have this Netflix program that's in development, but you also have several novels. It was my understanding, several of your novels have been optioned over the years. Not greenlit yet, but they've been optioned. Can you speak now to begin with, if it's option, they're paying you money kind of for the right to hold it. They've got first dibs on it. Is that is that how that works? Yeah, I mean, depending on who options it, whether it's a channel or whether it's a producer, or whether it's an actor, you know, they may they option it with the with the intention of trying to to shop it around, basically, mm -hmm. like they need to pay for the right to do that. In this case, there it's an option by, you know, Jessica Alba received the book she fell in love with it she brought it to her producers so already we have the actress and the producers and the producers brought it to netflix and they um have agreed to uh they they were the ones that that created the option for the whole team um they have a they found a writer so there's a writer now sharice castro smith who um, wrote Encanto and also the Netflix mm. series, The Haunting of Hill House. So very, very uh, successful, excellent writer. So we have the writer, there's a script. Um, so we're definitely moving in the right direction. In the past, it's never, we've never come this far before. So yeah, it's great. So if somebody is listening who uh, I've never read Lisa Unger, and uh, obviously you would want them to get off to a good start with you, what novel would you tell the new reader would be a good kickoff? It's so funny because it's, you know, I, when people ask me that, I always ask, well, what do you like to read? Because the books are all very different. You know, they all have different layers and all my characters are really different. My, my publisher will tell you, um, you know, read the new hardcover. <laughs> <laughs> and in this case, and in this case, you know, that's probably it's probably a good entry because it is a standalone. It doesn't tie into some of my books chain link by character and by my fictional town called the Hollows, even though anyone you can enter the, you know, you can enter the world from any portal, right? Like they all kind of they all kind of stand alone. But I think Secluded Cabin Sleep Six um is probably the best place to start. There you go. The most recent one. And, right. um, and uh, you know, I'm sure that you feel that your writing and, and storytelling has become more proficient over time. I uh, certainly hope so. Yeah. yeah <laughs> that's normally the case. So let me ask you, if you could go back in time and uh, meet your 25 year old self, what would you, what would you tell your 20, uh, 25 year old uh, Lisa Unger, if you could go back in time, what would she need to hear from you and it doesn't have to be writing necessarily just well, what message would you want to deliver to your younger self i think with the, it, with the benefit of your experience now yeah and i think it's interesting because at 25 years old i was working in publishing you know i was a book publicist and that was the moment in time where i was writing the least right like my job had gotten so big um that, you know, I had let this novel that I started when I was 19, I had kind of just let it lay fallow. And it was right around that time that I started to have some epiphanies about my life, you know, that this was the only thing I ever wanted to do. And that, 
you know, I had to get really serious about it at some point. And so I think what I would tell her is that, you know, you can do this, you know, you are this, you've always been this and in your heart, you know, that, and my years in publishing kind of gave me that permission, right. To understand that in fact, writing is a real job and people do it. And if you have that desire to do it, maybe you can do it too. So I think I would just tell her to, you know, have faith, have faith in this thing that you've always known and, you know, you can do it and you will do it. Well, what about uh, when you were 25 and you had this job that was consuming you and keeping Mm -hmm. you from the writing, what did you end up doing? Well, so I just had this epiphany where I realized that like, you know, I was going to have to look back at myself five years, 10 years down the road and go, you know what? You never even tried to do this. And so I got very serious about finding the time to write every single day. And so if that meant getting up super early in the morning before work, if that meant writing on the train, if that meant staying in, this is like, you know, before I was married, before I had a kid, all that stuff, you know, it was just me and my job and, you know, my life. And so I got very serious about like, you know, if I had, you know, if I was going to stay in on the weekends to work on the novel, whatever it had to be, I was going to work on that book every single day until it was done. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. And I did eventually finish it. What has been the, the uh, and that was the first book that I got published. It was okay. So that commitment really paid off for you. And, yeah, and I mean, it took, a long time, it took a long time to write it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you know, eventually that was the one that that did. That was my. Uh, I was signed on pretty quickly by Elaine Markson, um, who was a, a big literary agent, um, and she has since you know uh, became ill and passed away. But she was my agent mm. for thirteen years. And she was the first person to really believe in me to say, yeah, you can do this. We can do this. And she was able to broker a two book deal with St. Martin's Press to, to, for the book that I had written and for the second book that I was already writing. What was the uh, title of the first one? Angel Fire. Angel Fire. Mm-hmm. So, um, hmm. what is the most, this is a difficult question, I realize, so I, I won't blame you if you take a pass on this one, but I'm curious what the most influential book you've ever read is. And it doesn't have to be a novel. It may have been a nonfiction book that played a a role in your life. Yeah, I would say, I mean, of course, you know, as a lifelong reader, it is a difficult question, but I would say the book that impacted me the most was In Cold Blood by Truman Capote. Mm. That was powerful. Uh, I remember reading that in school. Yeah, it was a powerful book. And, you know, I was already in love with his language. You know, I was already you know, from, you know, especially his short fiction and vignettes, like other voices, other rooms and music for chameleons. So I was already in, you know, just in love with his writing. Um, And then when I read In Cold Blood, you know, and I was young, like too, like too young to be reading it. Um, But um, I just felt so moved by the way he examined darkness and, you know, these, these, you know, very damaged, broken personalities and did so with, you know, just tremendous empathy and compassion, you know, and it felt like it gave me permission to be, to look into the darkness, you know, to see what was there, but to do it, you know, with a deep respect for humanity. So tell me, if you were organizing a dinner party and you could invite any three literary figures, whether dead or alive, who would you invite? Okay, well, um, for sure, the Bronte sisters. Mm. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. Um, because, you know, I would just, I have a lot of questions <laughs> 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 about the books, about their lives, about what it was like to write when they were writing. And so for sure that, and um, and also Stephen King. <laughs> And Stephen King, he was a big, he was a big influence on you as well, huh? Huge influence, a huge influence, you know, absolutely. I mean, he's just iconic, you know, and his storytelling is beyond, you know, that of, I mean, I can't think of anybody who even compares to him. 
in so and for on all different levels in so many different ways. And so, um, yes, I would definitely th that's my choice. A little bit, you know, a little bit eclectic, but there you go. That's what it is. <laughs> Well, Lisa Unger, thank you for taking the time. And for our listeners, um, Lisa's URL to her website is is in, it's in the episode notes, so you can see all of her uh, books there and learn more about her there. But Lisa, thank you for the time. Uh, you've been uh, generous with it, and um, congratulations on all your success. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a great conversation.